Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all here this morning. My name is Ryan Schmitz. I'm the pastor here at the church, and we're so glad that you're here with us to join us in this service. I came in this morning at about uh, 8 o'clock or so and uh, saw Jack here and just said, it is true. There really is another drummer. It's so great. It wasn't just a dream. So thank you, Jack. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, praise team in general. Actually, someone came up to me today and said, you don't know Jack about drumming. I said, yes, I do. He's right over there on the drummer. So, so thanks, Jack. That was my bad joke for today. That's good. This time next year, we're, or next week, we're going to be on a plane um, heading up to Guatemala, and so we're going to really miss you guys. Uh, I'll be gone for two weeks, and I was um, looking back at my calendar, and this will be the first time since we moved here that I'll be gone for two weeks at a time. So that's uh, new for me. So I'll really miss you guys, but we are having Pastor Jerry come again, and he's going to fill in the pulpit for those two weeks, and we're just excited to have him and his heart share the message of God with us. So that's good. So we're going to continue into Rick Warren's study of Psalm 23 this morning to discover how to dwell in the goodness of God. Psalm 23 is really the most compact explanation of the goodness of God that we have in Scripture. It's only six little verses long, but it is just chock full of these benefits, these nine ways that God's goodness wants to show up in every area of your life. And so for the last two months, we have covered the first three verses of this, of this passage. And so we're just now getting to the other side. We're halfway there. Um, but it is just amazing how much is in this. And so I want to start our service doing what we've done for the last couple months, and that is reading Psalm 23 aloud together. Um, and I want you to read these, but then as we read them, I also want you to claim these verses as truth over your life this morning. So would you please read? We're going to read the first four verses of Psalm 23. We don't want to read all of them at one time and just blow our fuses in our minds. So we're going to go step by step. Just read the first four verses. Would you read them with me, okay? The Lord is my shepherd. I will lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the right paths for his name's sake. Even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. All right, thank you very much. I want to thank you, uh, thank Rob too for being on the back with the computer, with uh, Rick being gone. Uh, thank you for filling in for us that way too. Yeah, absolutely. Very good. It's got a challenge. So uh, thank you. So there are a lot of metaphors in this passage as we've been seeing through the last couple months. Um, David is using this shepherd motif to really talk about these ways that God wants to bless your life. We saw how he as the shepherd wants to provide for you so that you lack nothing. He wants to give you rest in a very restless world. He wants to lead you to the green pastures and to the still waters. Remember, green pastures don't just happen. You are led to them, and God wants to lead you there. He wants to restore your soul, those emotions, those broken feelings, those, that broken conscience in your life. He wants to restore that in you. He wants to lead you in the pathways, the right paths of life, and lead you out of danger. Though you will go through valleys, as we saw last week, there will be dark times, there will be valleys, but God is the God of the valleys, and he wants to see you through the valleys in life. And today we're going to be be focusing on this next phrase in verse 4, and that is, your rod and staff, they comfort me. Now, I'd like to ask you this morning, how many of you woke up, stretched, got out of bed, maybe went on to Facebook, and put your morning post into Facebook and said, boy, I am so thankful this morning that I am so comforted that God's rod and staff comfort me? How many of you did that? You know, if that's such a big deal that God's rod and staff covered us, you know, I went onto my phone to look for an emoji of a rod and staff. Do you know that there's not one emoji for a rod and staff? There's a hockey stick. That's about as close as I got. <laughs> what does this mean? There's so many questions that come up in my mind. Your rod and staff comfort me. How can two sticks bring comfort to my life? 
How can these two tools that a shepherd uses bring comfort to my life and your life this morning? I think out of all of the different little phrases in Psalm 23, this one really is going to require the most explanation, uh, mostly because not a lot of people in here this morning are sheep herders. Raise your hand if you are. Not most of us are culturally surrounded in our, in our world around sheep. Okay, and we're also talking about ancient text here. We're talking about a different life, a different culture, a different time frame. If we were to go back in time, 2,500 years, and we were to say to everyone, hey, my Glock and my bulletproof vest, they comfort me. <laughs> what, do th- what do you think they would say? It doesn't make much sense, and that's kind of how it is for us. So we've got to dig and do a little research about what this means, because for 2,500 years, this has been preserved for us. This, is, this sort of um, symbolism is a message that God wants us to know today, his rod and his staff, they comfort us. So I want to give you a little bit of background. So I actually brought some props. I got a rod and a staff, Okay. This is a rod and a staff, um, and you know that the word pastor in the Bible is the same word for shepherd. So I'm the shepherd of my flock. This is my rod, and this is my staff. What do you think? This is a plastic staff, but that doesn't mean much. We'll just bypass this, okay? Um, that's right. That's right. This is an authentic one. This one's, this one's cool. Um, but so there's two sticks. When some people have read that passage before, they've said, okay, my rod and my staff are talking about the same thing. They're actually talking about two separate tools that have two very different applications, okay? These tools are incredibly ancient tools. They've been using uh, these for thousands of years by shepherds. They're still using these same tools today, which is interesting, okay? The rod is a defensive tool, okay? It would be used against predators, it'd be used against wolves, anyone who's trying to attack your sheepfold. Um, I was, I made one out of a cane that I bought at Goodwill, and I was showing it to to Dan Ford, and Dan Ford said, how'd you like to have a real shepherd's rod? I said, you got a real shepherd's rod? He said, sure, Lauren's got one. So I borrowed this from Lauren, and I got to thinking, why does Lauren have a shepherd's rod? (laughs) But she's married to Dan. So I get to, and there are a lot of notches on this. I mean, it is pretty funny. We're trying to figure out, but this is a really heavy weapon. It's pretty interesting. Um, and uh, there's two ways so you can hold this rod. Usually a rod is about a foot and a half long to two feet long. And there's two applications of how you could hold this. You could actually hold it on this end, and you would use this to kind of ward off those lesser uh, threatening predators, that person that's annoying your flock, that little wolf that comes into your flock, or, sh- or a coyote that comes into your flock, that sort of thing. Sometimes the shepherds would tie a little... Um, a leather strap to this side. They would use it as a handle or they would unravel it and they would kind of use it as a whip to direct the sheep in the direction you want to go. The other side of this is the business side of this. This really could do a lot of damage. So if you have a mountain lion, you have a wolf, you have something that's really coming to threaten your flock, this will do some damage. And I've been playing with this all week and it really is pretty cool as a weapon. Um, It's a defensive weapon. So a rod, you might want to write this down in your notes so that you can keep tracking me through this explanation. But a rod is used for guarding and protecting. A rod is used for guarding and protecting your flock, okay? It's protecting the sheep. Sheep are really essentially defenseless animals, aren't they? If you think about the way that they were made, they have no claws, they don't run very fast. Their teeth aren't very sharp because they chew on, on grass and things like that. They're pretty defenseless. They're also not the smartest animals in the world. I'm a little offended sometimes that God calls us sheep in Scripture uh, because I look at a sheep and go, surely I'm not like that. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I get out of one of my jokes. Now, the rod is for defense of the staff... Thank you. Okay. The staff, bring it on back. The staff is used for guiding and directing. 
The staff is used for guiding and directing. You're probably more familiar um, with the shepherd's staff than you are the rod. Okay, uh, this is seen all over the place. Some of you may even have some of these in your garden that hold up plants. Uh, we see these all over. Uh, but the, the, diff- the thing about this is sheep have the tendency to wander. They're not very smart animals, like I said. The shepherd's staff is longer. It would have a hook, or they call this a crook, on one end, and so that you would be able to uh, uh, pull or pull. Uh, with, with the sheep with this, the hook part, or you'd be able to poke them in the direction you want them to go with the other end of the staff, okay? Um, sheep often in that territory grazed on mountainous terrain as well. Very rocky, very hard. Uh, and so oftentimes they would get near cliffs. They would get near ledges. They would fall off sometimes. Oftentimes the sheep were off balance and they were falling. And so this end of the staff, the hook part would be to go to that edge and be able to retreat retrieve that sheep when it falls. It also was there to take him away from the ledge. You would hook it underneath the thigh or the leg or sometimes the neck and you would pull that sheep back away from the dangerous spot. All right. Um, They would reach down and retrieve them. So this really is a tool of recovery. If a sheep fell into a bramble uh, patch that had a bunch of thorns in it and it would have been dangerous for the sheep, the shepherd to go into, they would take the sheep and they would pull it out of the thorny patch. So this is really a tool of of rescue. It's a tool of recovery, a tool of guidance. It's to get you out of a tight jam. Now, universally, the rod and the staff have been used this way literally for century after century. And if you go into uh, places today that have sheep, they still use that same method today, which is pretty interesting. Now, that's what these tools do, okay? They guard and they guide. So let's apply it to our metaphor this morning morning, God's rod and staff comfort us. God's goodness guards and guides you this morning. That's pretty great. It's not all it is, though. If that weren't enough, there's more to the rod and staff statement than just that. Not only were the rod and staff used by shepherds, but they were also known to be symbolic pieces throughout history. They had a message behind them. People at the time when Psalm 23 was written would have understood that the rod and staff have symbolic properties as well. And for instance, you can write this down too. The staff or the rod not only guards and protects, but the rod also represents power and authority. The rod would represent power and authority. If you were holding a rod, you would say, I'm in charge. I've got more power than you do. I am the one in control. Do you remember in uh, Proverbs chapter 13 where it says, whoever spares the rod hates his children? You guys ever heard that before? Do not spare the rod. You know, that's not talking about beating your kids up. It's not taking this and saying, I'm not sparing this rod. You know? That's not at all. It's referring to the presence of authority and power. I dealt with an occult with one of the youth students that I had who uh, had grown up, went to college, uh, found himself in this small house church who was really a loving group of people. And one of the things that they did as part of their theology was the elders were supposed to come to a house when there was a newborn in their house. And part of their theology was to take a rod and spank the child at three years old. Because you don't spare the rod, right? Wrong. That is totally the non-biblical approach of what this means. This is talking about the authority that you have as a parent. This verse does not say beat up your children. It it doesn't say not to discipline your children. That's That's not what this is saying. But it's saying don't beat it up. This is about authority. Whoever doesn't parent their children with authority isn't doing their children any favors. That's what it's saying. If you're trying to be your child's best friend, you're doing it wrong. You have to be the adult. You have to raise your kids right. You have to be the authority, the power in your life. This rod represents power and authority. Not only does the staff represent guidance and direction, but the staff also represents care and compassion. 
care and compassion. So you can write that down as well. The rod represents power and authority. The staff represents care and compassion. It's based on how it's used. It's for getting us out of trouble. It's for caring for us. Now the shepherd, staff, and rod are both found as far back as the Egyptian hieroglyphics. Okay, if you were to look on the screen here, what do you see in this picture? You see a pharaoh, right? An Egyptian king. And what's he holding? He's holding a rod and a shepherd's staff. Isn't that interesting? He, now, what's interesting about that is the Egyptians would say that shepherds were like the low of the low, the scum of the earth. They, if you look at when the Israelites moved into Egypt, they wanted them outside of town because they didn't, they didn't want to be a part of them. All right? And yet, the symbol of authority and power and care are found in the rod and the shepherd's staff. You all know this next guy. This is the shiniest dead guy ever. Okay? <laughs> King Tut, what's he holding in his hand? Notice he's got the shepherd's staff in one hand, the rod in the other. He also called that a flail in Egyptian, but it's the rod. It's the same thing. One is used to fight off enemies. The other one is for caring. When the Pharaoh was holding this, he was saying, I'm both the protector of my nation and I'm in charge. I both care about my nation and I can be tough. I am the authority. So it was really a symbol of authority. It's like a badge. So, okay, you ready for this? Now let's bring it all back into Psalm 23, verse 4, those six words, God's rod and staff guards and guides you. It says, I am in control. I have power and authority. I am in charge. I will protect you. I will direct you. And I also care deeply for you. I will get you back on track when you get off course, when you're off balance, when you walk through the valleys of life, when you wander, or when you flat out fall off the cliff, I will bring you back. When other authorities promise guarding and guiding but fail, has that ever happened to any of you? Has anybody came to you with that badge of authority and power saying, I'm going to trust me, I will care for you only to be hurt by them? Of course you have, right? All of us have, whether intentional or unintentional. But this little statement in Psalm 23 says, I'm not just another pharaoh. I'm not just another governor and agent. I'm not just another badge. This is saying, even when the ones who are supposed to care about me drop the ball and fail, your rod and staff, God's rod and staff, comfort me. That's awesome. Guides me, protects me, rescues me, fights for me, cares for me, comforts me. I mean, isn't God good? What a huge statement. Now, throughout the Bible, sheep are a symbol for God's people. The church is called the flock of God. The Bible says that we are his sheep. The psalm says we are his flock, the sheep of his pasture. Jesus calls himself the good shepherd. You look at John chapter 10, and also interestingly enough, in other parts of Scripture, he's called the great shepherd. He's called the chief shepherd in, in 1 Peter 5. He's the top. And you get to John chapter 10, verse 10, and it says this. Jesus is speaking, and he says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the fullest. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Brothers and sisters, what we've got to understand as we look at the goodness of God, we must understand how fully invested God is to us. God is way more invested into you than you are into him. The Bible even says when you are faithless, he's still faithful because he can't deny himself. This is incredible truth. The chief the great and good shepherd is so invested in guarding and guiding us that he sacrificed his own life for ours in a display of power. He rose from the dead. He came to us when we were lost and we were alone and we were scattered like sheep without a shepherd and he brought us in. He rescued us. He brought us into his fold. Outside of his fold, we are lost. We are alone. We are separated from the good shepherd. But when we trust Jesus and allow him to lead, he guards and he guides us. His rod and his staff comfort us. Six words. Huge statement. 
God deserves all the praise. I want to conclude today. I just want to look at some thoughts, okay? As we understand, this is only six words, so I want to look at our good shepherd. I want to look at the actual words of Jesus, our good shepherd, and, and how he treats us. And this is how God wants to treat you this morning with his rod and staff, all right? Number one, if I bring Jesus my hurts, he will show me compassion. If I bring him my hurts, Jesus shows me compassion. Nine, Matthew chapter 9 verse 36 is this. When Jesus saw the crowds, his heart was filled with compassion. If you have that in your Bibles, and you have your Bibles open, you want to you underline that. When he saw them and his heart was filled with compassion for them because they were hurting and they didn't know where to get help. They were like sheep without a shepherd. You know, there's a difference between sympathy, empathy, and compassion. Sympathy is when you feel bad that somebody's hurt. You send them a sympathy card, right? Hope you get better soon, right? A little deeper than that, a little bit more invested in that is empathy, when you empathize with somebody. And that's when you say, man, not only am I sad that you're hurt, but I hurt with you. I, empath I empathize with you. I can't even say that word. You're, you're empathetic towards that person. I'm sorry you're hurt. I'm hurting with you. But compassion, compassion is when you take sympathy, empathy, and you add those together and you add one more. You say, I'm hurting I'm sad that you're hurt. I'm hurting with you. And in compassion, I'm going to do everything I can to stop the hurt. That's compassion. Compassion says, I'm going to stop. I'm going to look at everything that I can do to do everything I can do to stop the pain. The Bible repeatedly says that Jesus looked at the people who were in pain, who were lost, who had problems, who were broken, who were used up because of sin, and who was moved with compassion. And he says, I will do anything it takes to stop the hurt, even if it means dying on the cross. And you know what? He's still saying the same thing today. He still looks at your pain. He still looks at your hurt. He looks over at the mistakes and the addictions and the problems and all the miry clay stuff that we have in your, our life. And he says, I'm here for you. I'm passionate about you. I'm sorry you're hurting. I hurt with you. And I want to do something about it. That's the rod and staff. You know, what I have found in the testimonies of people that I have met is that often people don't want to come to Christ because they don't really, it's not that they don't believe in God, it's that they don't believe God believes in them. They really don't want to bring their mess and their problems and their failures to Jesus. And so instead they hang on to him and they let him dwell in their life and they let them become heavy and it becomes a part of their everyday life. The other day I was in a car with somebody and I was in their car, and they, they, I mean, I think they went through like a, a, a sea of bugs because I got in their car, and the windshield was just covered in dead bugs. I mean, it was everywhere. And so instead, instead of like cleaning the car, they took the windshield wipers and thought they would just smear the bugs. And, and you know, have you ever done that? It just makes, so there's these smear lines all over the windshield. I said, dude, why don't you clean your windshield? He said, no, I can see right here. If I look like right here, I can see through there. And I said, why don't you clean all the gunk off of your windshield? windshield so you can see the full picture of what's in front of you. And oftentimes we do the same thing with our pains and our failures. We let them hang on to our life. The only way you're going to have failures in life is if you're driving forward. Just like if you're going to get dead bugs, the only way you're going to get dead bugs in your life is if you're driving forward. If you want to protect your car, clean your car, living in a garage, put a cover over it, you'll never have to worry about that. But as long as you're moving forward in life, there are going to be dead things. There's going to be problems. There's going to be failures. And God has given us the opportunity to wipe it clean. But we've got to do it. We've got to bring our failures to God. We've got to let them do it. You know, it's, this, it's a foreign thought to me. And this is where that amazing part comes and amazing grace. Is when I come forward and I finally get the courage and I finally get the strength, and I go before God, and I bring him my hurts. Do you know what he does? He doesn't shame me. He doesn't scold me. 
He doesn't intimidate me. He doesn't parade me around as a failure. Do you know what he does? He has compassion on me. And he says, oh, I hurt with your hurt. And I want to do everything I can. I want to use all the resources I have. And what is God's resources for us? Limitless resources. Number two, not only if I bring him my hurts, Jesus shows me compassion. But number two, if I get confused and I wander off, Jesus finds me and brings me back. Jesus has some real specific things to say about this. And some of you guys have even experienced this in your own life. But Matthew chapter 18 verse 12 says this, If a shepherd has 100 sheep and one wanders away and is lost, won't he leave the 99 safe sheep and go search for the lost one? The answer is yes. Why? Because every sheep matters. You matter to God. You matter so much to God. He says, if I've got 100 sheep, 99 of them are saved, one of them is lost, I'm going to go after the unsaved one. I'm going after them because I care about them. By the way, that's the heartbeat of Trinity Church. We care about the lost. We should never stop growing as a congregation as long as there is one person in this world that needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have a mission in front of us to share it. Did you know that heaven celebrates when one sinner repents? Just one. And a whole myriad of angels. Ah, It's awesome. The Bible says that there was a point where all of us were lost without God. Remember that? Remember when Isaiah 53 verse 6 says, We are all like sheep who've wandered off and gotten lost. We've all done our own thing. We've all gone our own way. Everyone has done it. And then he starts talking about Jesus before Jesus even came. He starts talking about what Jesus did on the cross. He said, we're all like sheep, but God has piled all of our sins, everything we've done wrong on him. Guys, it's in our human nature to wander. It's our human nature to get lost. And God says, I'll be the good shepherd. I'm going to come. I'm going to seek and save the lost. Number three, Jesus shows me compassion. He finds me when I wander. And number three, if I fail or if I fall, Jesus rescues me. Jesus rescues and recovers me. Like all sheep, we not only wander, we also stumble. How many of you have fallen down many, many times in your life? Anyone want to stand up here and give me a testimony on that? No, neither do I. (laughs) But But we do. We have those stories. Every time I wander, I get into trouble. The further I get away from God, the more problems I'm going to have in my life. All sheep stumble. All sheep fall. How does Jesus react to this? What do you think Jesus does when you fall or when you fail or when you really embarrass yourself? How does Jesus Christ respond to you? Well, let's look at scripture. Matthew chapter 12 says this. And Jesus said, if any of you has a sheep that falls into a pit on the Sabbath, he's talking to these Pharisees, and this is the day that you're not supposed to work according to Jewish law. Even if you have a sheep that falls into the pit on the Sabbath, will you not rescue it and lift it out? Even though it's the Sabbath, you got to shave, save your sheep. It says, how much more valuable is a man than a sheep? Jesus says, even if a sheep falls into a pit, you're going to rescue it. It is common sense to God that he is to rescue you when you fall. It just makes sense. It's in his nature. God's grand plan, in fact, the whole heartbeat of the gospel is rescue. It's reconciliation. It's to restore. He doesn't see you for the pit that you're in. He doesn't see you for the dirt on your face. He sees you for the value that you are in Christ. He doesn't see you for the mistakes. He sees you for who you are. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 25 says, You'll never need to be afraid of sudden disaster or hidden troubles that ensnare the wicked. For the Lord is your security. He would keep you safe and keep your foot from getting caught in a trap. That's what that hook is for on the shepherd's staff. God is there with that hook to take us away from those dangerous spots. We might fight him a little bit on it. It might hurt us when he gets us with that hook. But it's critical for our our security. Last one, not exhausted of course, but last one I want to talk about today is because Jesus is your good shepherd, 
If I trust him to save me, Jesus keeps me saved. If I trust him to save me, Jesus keeps me saved. It is important that I bring this up because a lot of us are thinking, man, I've really wandered so far from God and God cannot love me now. Or whatever it might be. It is the Savior's job to keep you saved. Makes sense, right? It is not your job to save yourself. It is not your job to keep yourself saved. It is the job, is your job to put your hand in the hand of God's and say, God, I'm all yours. The good, the bad, the ugly, and everything in between. I could never earn this relationship with you on my own. This is all for God. I'm accepting this gift of salvation. I'm accepting your son as my savior. I'm accepting this good shepherd. I am putting my hand in your hand. I know there'll be days where I want to let go. I know there'll be days where I will doubt, but I'm never going to get out of your hand because you love me and you're my good shepherd. Even when we are faithless, he remains faithful. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for the courts above. John chapter 10, verse 27. You got to check out this verse. Jesus' words directly. He says, my sheep, listen to my voice. That's how you know who's a believer and who's not. My sheep, listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Then he says, I give them eternal life, which starts at the moment you put your hand in his hand and they will never die No one can steal them out of my hand. My father gave my sheep to me. He is greater than all, and no person can steal my sheep out of my father's hand. And I love verse 30. I and the father are one. You see, guys, once you have put your life in the hand of God, there will be times where you might want to pull back, especially in the valleys. You'll doubt You'll say, God, do I really believe what I believe? But God says, I am not letting you go. I am not letting you go. He says, you're in God's hand. No man can pluck you out of God's hand. Your salvation is secure. You cannot lose your salvation once you've gotten it. You were saved. If you were saved by works, the moment that you stopped working would be the moment you lose your salvation. But if you're saved by the merits of Christ, then you would only lose that salvation when Christ is demerited. And he has no demerits. He has no sin. It is forever. You know what this is called? Grace. You put your life in his hand and you say, There's, they're in my hand. He says, they're mine now. No one can pluck them out. Words associated with salvation in Scripture are eternal, forever, everlasting. Does that sound like temporary? Does that sound insecure? Never ending? One may say, well, pastor, someone could let go of God's hand. I've heard someone say that one time. And I want to stop and go, really? So how, how big is God's hand that he's going to let go of? You know, sometimes when my little two-year-old, my son was two, we would walk across the street and sometimes he'd want to go running. He'd let go of the hand. But you know what? I didn't let go. You know, when the Bible says that God's hands holds the waters of the earth, so really you're going to get out of that? Tell me where the edge of God's hand is that you can jump off of. It's unfathomable. He's so much bigger than that. We cannot imagine the size of God's hands, let alone jump out of them. Here, I want you to look at the screen here. Romans chapter 8 says it about as clear as could be. There is nothing, this is the Bible, there is nothing that could ever separate us from his love. Death can't, life can't. That about covers everything, right? Let's keep going. Angels can't, demons can't, our fears for today can't, our worries about tomorrow can't, even the powers of hell can't keep God's love away from you. When you put your hand in the hand of the master, it's secure. And whether we are high above the sky or in the deepest ocean, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Man, that brings me comfort. 
man, that lets me know that, man, if I, if I stumble, if I fall, if I do fail in life, I can come to my shepherd and he can get me back on track. His rod and his staff will guide me, guard me, prod me, protect me, guide me. That's awesome. Let's bow our heads. Do you know the shepherd this morning? I want to end by asking this question. Who's your shepherd? Who is your shepherd? Can you truly say this morning, the Lord is my shepherd? I think it's kind of different now. I think I want to go into Facebook and say, his rod and staff, they comfort me. Are you a sheep without a shepherd this morning? You know, it's not going to last very long in this life as a solitary sheep on your own. There are just too many predators. You need a shepherd, and that's Jesus. You need a flock to be a part of, that's a church. You need to be a part of a good church home, that's, that's the flock. Let me ask another question. Knowing now how Jesus treats his sheep, which flock do you want to be in? If not Jesus, then who? Who's going to offer a better deal? There's no political group that can offer that. No economic group. There's no social group. There's no age group. There's no gender group. Nobody can offer the comfort, the guard, and the guide as the good shepherd. You only need, you only get them from the creator of the universe, the son of God. I invite you to pray this prayer with, uh, this, this prayer with me now. No matter where you are, I want you to say, Dear Jesus Christ, I want you to be my shepherd. I need you to guide me. I need you to guard me. I want you to protect me. I want you to direct me like the rod and the staff. I thank you for your power and authority. I thank you that only you can protect me. I thank you that you care and have compassion for me. I bring you my hurts and I exchange it for your compassion. I can stop wandering and find rescue. I can bring my failures and you can restore me. Jesus Christ, thank you because I trust you to save me alone and to know that you're going to keep me saved. I know that in your flock, no one can steal me. Nothing will ever separate me from the love of Jesus Christ. Today at this moment, I put my hand in your hand. I want to be a part of your family. I want to be a part of your flock. I want to follow you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.